I would like to welcome all of you to our CHESS webinar, Improving ILD Diagnosis and Predicting Clinical Progression with the Invisia Genomic Classifier. I am uh, William Bullman. I am a pulmonologist, formerly of the Columbia University Medical Center, and now I serve as the Medical Director for Pulmonology uh, for Verisight, uh, a company based out of uh, South San Francisco uh, that is a global uh, genomics uh, uh, testing uh, uh, company. Uh, our learning objectives today for this webinar uh, we will review updated 2022 uh, IPF and PPF guidelines. Uh, we have uh, one of our guideline authors here as one of our speakers. We're very honored to have her. Uh, we're going to also understand how the Invisia Genomic Classifier works and understand its role in the diagnosis and prognosis of ILD patients. And finally, we're going to highlight new Invisia data on the prediction of progression in some patients with ILD. And that's data that was presented uh, by uh, Verisite and some of our external uh, collaborators at the CHESP meetings and the ERS meetings this past fall. So I'm very pleased to have with us our two speakers. Uh, Dr. Sandeep Bansal is the Medical Director of the Lung Center and the Medical Director of the Interventional Pulmonology Program at Penn Highlands Healthcare in Western Pennsylvania. And we also have uh, Dr. Anna Podolanchuk. She is an Assistant Professor of Medicine at Weill Cornell, uh, she is a nationally recognized expert on the interstitial lung diseases, and she was one of the authors of the recent guideline update. So uh, with that, I will leave it to uh, Dr. Bonsall and Dr. Podolich. Thanks, Bill, for that introduction. We are going to start talking about first how to improve um, the diagnosis of interstitial lung disease. So um, making an accurate diagnosis of interstitial lung disease and specifically um, the different type of types of interstitial lung disease is important because it informs the initial treatment. We know that immunosuppression may stabilize lung function in appropriately selected patients with interstitial lung disease, but it is harmful for patients with idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis. And you can see here on this graph that for patients, for example, with connective tissue disease, associated interstitial lung disease, who may have had um, progressive FEC decline prior to initiating immunosuppression, when they were started on MMF, um, they may actually have improvements in FEC. Um, on the other hand, patients with idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis or IPF um, should be treated with antifibrotics. And we now have very good data from multiple large randomized clinical trials showing that antifibrotics slow disease progressions with IPF. And in uh, pooled analyses, for example, here from the Impulses study, which looked at treatment with nintetinib, patients with, uh, with IPF had improved survival um, when they were treated with antifibrotics shown here in the blue line compared to patients treated with placebo. And uh, to get deeper into this, we know that um, a pattern of usual interstitial pneumonia or UIP um, is a critical factor or a a biomarker is how I think of it in diagnosing idiopathic, idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis, as well as informing prognosis um, in patients with various interstitial lung diseases. And we diagnose IPF when a patient has a UIP pattern on, uh, on CT scan, on high resolution chest CT, or in pathology. And we know that um, now, um, in many cases, um, a chest CT is sufficient for a diagnosis of UIP when there is a pattern of um, a definite UIP pattern on CT. But a UIP pattern can also be found in other types of interstitial lung diseases, for example, in hypersensitivity pneumonitis and in connective tissue disease associated interstitial lung diseases. And patients with those types of interstitial lung diseases that have a UIP pattern often have um, disease behavior that mimics that of idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis. I mean, you can see here on the right that, for example, in patients with RAILD, um, a UIP pattern, which is that that bottom line, is often associated with um, the with, with the worst survival, with a poor prognosis that can be indistinguishable from that of um, the the natural history of IPF, as compared to patients with a different pattern, like an NSAP pattern, where they have uh, improved survival. So again, finding those patients who 
have that UIP pattern um, can be critical um, in terms of improving, uh, in terms of correctly prognosticating in these diseases and to collect um, correctly um, selecting treatment. And so with that in mind, we uh, recently um, published um, an, uh, the updated uh, guidelines for the diagnosis um, and management of IPF. And in those guidelines, there was an updated diagnostic algorithm. And so the key changes in that algorithm were that a probable UIP pattern on high resolution chest CT can be diagnosed as IPF after multi multidisciplinary discussion without lung biopsy confirmation in the appropriate clinical setting. There's actually a lot of discussion on the guideline committee um, whether the UI probable and definite UIP pattern should be merged. And in the end, we decided to keep it separate because probable UIP pattern in some cases may identify patients who have other types of interstitial lung diseases. Um, and so it, that, that appropriate clinical um, scenario is critical. And so, for example, for a patient who's over the age of 60 um, and uh, male and has an appropriate smoking, uh, uh, appropriate exposure history, uh, for example, with smoking, um, may end up being diagnosed with IPF when they have a probable UIP pattern. But somebody who's younger and female um, may need additional workup. And in those guidelines, um, we also said that uh, bronchoalveolar lavage may be appropriate in some patients with a probable UIP pattern um, to try to different when other types of interstitial lung diseases are suspected um, and maybe performed before multidisciplinary discussions. An important update to the guidelines was also regarding transbronchial lung cryobiopsy. Um, in the guidelines, we said that it may be a reasonable alternative to surgical lung biopsies in centers that have the appropriate expertise, and it can be done with or without bronchial alveolar lavage. So you have the updated uh, the, uh, algorithm on the right, and uh, for a patient suspected of having IPF, the first step is to rule out um, or assess potential causes or associated conditions, and then to look at the CT scan. And for a patient where there is no associated uh, cause for their interstitial lung disease and there's no associated conditions such as an, um, connective tissue disease, the high resolution chest CT pattern can often determine the next step. So a patient with a UIP pattern, and for many patients with a probable UIP pattern, um, a confident diagnosis of idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis can be reached um, after multidisciplinary discussion. But for patients with who are indeterminate for UIP or where a CT shows an alternate diagnosis, additional steps are often needed. And that can include bronchoalveolar lavage with transbronchial and cryobiopsy, or surgical lung biopsy. And then all that data gets integrated again in the context of a multidisciplinary discussion to make a diagnosis of IPF or to, um, to make a diagnosis, uh, an alternative diagnosis. Uh, and so many of us are starting to use this uh, NVIDIA genomic classifier and are finding it useful in the context, uh, in incorporating it into this uh, this diagnostic algorithm that was put forward in the 2022 guidelines. Um, and this shows you where the Invisia genomic classifier could potentially fit. Um, it can be used um, for patients who have an indeterminate uh, pattern uh, on CT scan for UIP or a pattern suggestive of an alternative diagnosis or in select patients uh, who have a probable UIP pattern um, where there's still a reasonable chance that they might have an alternative um, diagnosis other than IPF. If those patients um, are not confidently diagnosed with a specific um, type of interstitial lung disease, the Invisia genomic classifier um, can be combined um, in the, uh, done in the context of a um, bronchoscopy or um, transbronchial lung clotting biopsy at the same time we can do the Invisia genomic classifier to get additional data to make uh, a more confident diagnosis of ILD. And this is just one quote from, um, from Allison Wong saying that the genomic classifier demonstrates how machine learning and molecular data can be integrated into clinical practice and, uh, and a foreshadow of how interstitial lung disease will likely evolve over time as we're moving away from surgical lung biopsies. 
So the NVIDIA genomic classifier is designed as a complement to high-resolution chest CT and clinical factors for a more confident uh, <coughs> diagnosis of idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis, as well as to better determine uh, prognosis in interstitial lung disease. And the genomic classifier is a binary test um, that comes back um, positive or negative for UIP, and it's designed to be used in patients with an indeterminate pattern for UIP on CT and in certain patients with probable UIP pattern. Um, and when the genomic classifier comes back positive for UIP in the appropriate clinical context, a more confident diagnosis of IPF can be made, or if it's non-IPF and it's still a UIP pattern, it may um, help to guide ILD prognosis. Um, a negative pattern um, leads to continued workup for interstitial lung disease um, for alternative diagnoses. It is important to remember that the classifier itself is, um, is a biomarker. It's another data point. It does not confer a clinical diagnosis of IPF, and it must be interpreted in the context of other clinical factors, including demographics, clinical history, and HRCT findings. So how does the NVIDIA classifier work? Well, the classifier detects a genomic pattern of the usual interstitial pneumonia using transbronchial biopsy samples. And so a patient um, is, needs to undergo a bronchoscopy and transbronchial lung biopsy, um, and three to five samples are co collected during routine bronchoscopy. And those samples are then sent to the, to the central lab to bear site and RNA is then extracted from the pooled samples and uh, next generation sequencing is used to construct a single whole transcriptome library from these samples. And when the classifier was first arrived, they looked at um, a thousands of different genes that were um, then using machine learning, um, and then 190 different genes were determined to be predictive of this UIP pattern. And so the genomic classifier now for patients prospectively is um, looking at that gene expression of those 190 genes to determine whether the sample is positive or negative for the usual interstitial pneumonia pattern. And so at the end, you get a result that's either positive or negative. And so I'm going to present some data on um, how the accuracy of the uh, genomic classifier was um, determined. This is data from the BRAVE study. This was a prospective multi-center study um, for the development and clinical validation of the NVIDIA classifier. Um, it was done at 30 different U.S. and European sites. Um, and it enrolled 447 patients um, who are undergoing clinical evaluation for interstitial lung disease um, and were determined to require tissue biopsy. And patients were assigned to three different arms. Brave one um, was where patients who were undergoing a surgical lung biopsy, and those patients then also underwent the transbronchial bi lung biopsy for the genomic classifier. Brave 2 were patients who were undergoing bronchoscopy and uh, transbronchial biopsy was added. And Brave 3 were patients who were undergo undergoing a, a transbronchial lung cryobiopsy and also underwent a transbronchial lung biopsy for the genomic classifier. All cases were reviewed centrally um, by pathologists and radiologists, and were then um, and a clinical diagnosis was then reached by multidisciplinary discussion, which is our current standard of care. Um, the classifier was <coughs> developed using um, ninety patients, and then there were two independent prospective clinical validation studies. The initial validation study included forty nine patients, and there was a second validation study that included 96 patients. And so in these two independent prospective clinical validation studies, the NVIDIA classifier identified a UIP pattern with a combined uh, specificity of 91% 
when it was compared to histopathology. And so you can see here um, the, the gray bar is the initial validation with 49 patients. It has um, a specific specificity of 90%. The, the light green bar is in the secondary validation, which was over 90%. And then combined in the dark green is a combined specificity of 90%. And so when the classifier was developed, um, it was really designed to have a high specificity because we really, um, based on the data I showed you, that a UIP pattern is so important to identify, to determine the appropriate uh, treatment of the patients and to help us determine the prognosis. And so when we have a high, such a high specificity, we're sacrificing a little bit of sensitivity. So the combined sensitivity in this study, in, um, in, the, in the two validation study was 63%, which means that one out of three patients who are negative for the uh, UIP pattern may still have that UIP pattern. Those patients, when they are negative, um, need to undergo um, further workup to determine their under underlying ILD. And that might include some additional testing or further multidisciplinary discussion to determine what, what their underlying diagnosis is. Uh, but the specific specificity is very, um, very good for this. And this was a... Um, uh, a, a secondary analysis of the Ray cohort that looked at the utility, the clinical utility of the Invisia uh, genomic classifier. And here it was shown that um, combined with high resolution chest CT, the genomic classifier identified twice as many uh, patients with a UIP pattern than high resolution chest CT alone. But what, what they did here is that um, the uh, the performance of Invisia classifier was um, looked at when used in conjunction with local radiology compared to local radiology alone. And um, patients uh, with local radiology diagnoses and who had the Invisia classifier results were scored for accuracy and yield in, the in detecting a UIP pattern against, against reference pathology, which is really the, the gold standard for a UIP um, for UIP. Um, and you can see here that local radiology, when the histopathology was UIP, local radiologists only called it UIP based on the high resolution chest CT 34% of the time. When Invisia was added to high resolution chest CT, that went up to nearly 80%. It was 79.2%, improve, significantly improving our diagnostic yield for UIP. Which is which is very uh, very helpful in, uh, in these patients, and the specificity of of the test was not affected in this study. Thank you, Anna. That was uh, uh, very nice, and I want to uh, thank uh, Chest and um, um, uh, Verisite for hosting this uh, webinar. Uh, you know, this is a sort of a perfect platform where we bring the academic, non-academic physicians, and the industry kind of together and. And, and learn from each other. So, um, so what I'm going to talk about is the clinical application of Envisia uh, classifier. So uh, as uh, Dr. Bullman uh, mentioned, I'm the medical director of the Lung Center at Penn Highlands Healthcare. It's a large community um, health center. We have uh, eight hospitals that are under our umbrella. Uh, so very large uh, patient population that we, uh, we treat. So, you know, who are the appropriate patients for Envisia genomic classifier? Uh, of course, the first and foremost uh, step is to pay attention to the history and physical examination. So if I'm evaluating an interstitial lung disease patient, I, you know, would spend typically 20 to 30 minutes going through their, you know, exposure history, their physical examination findings, and then looking at all the, um, uh, uh, the diagnostic data that they have. So, so when you determine that uh, there is no identifiable cause, for example, medication-related ILD or autoimmune disease or occupational, and there is a suspected ILD, um, the next step is to uh, get a high-resolution CT scan of the chest. So a uh, couple of things to remember about high uh, HRCT is that there are several factors that go um, in place to make HRCT happen. So it's not just a CT scan with thin slices. 
Uh, ideally, it should be done with inspiratory and expiratory views. Um, uh, ideally, it should be done with a supine and prone imaging with certain collimation and certain uh, dose of um, radiation. So once all those factors are achieved, uh, um, you look at the pattern that's uh, shown on the HRCT, and then you determine you know, whether this is a classic UIP, uh, which can you can start with the treatment uh, right away, and then um, um, uh, if clinically appropriate. And then the other three categories based on the ATS classification would be probable UIP, indeterminate UIP, or alternative diagnosis. And then in these three categories, the, the first two, probable and indeterminate, uh, there is certainly a, a value of using the genomic classifier. And then in the category of alternative diagnosis, if UIP is helpful for prognosis, you could consider the genomic classifier. And then, of course, you will look at the patient and see if they can tolerate the bronchoscopy. Um, typically, in our center, it takes about 10 to 12 minutes to, to complete this bronchoscopy procedure. Um, uh, and you collect about three to five samples in addition to your usual transbronchial biopsy specimens. Uh, so uh, that's the process that's followed uh, for these patients who are appropriate for the genomic classifier. So um, a patient example uh, that I'm going to present today, uh, this is uh, a patient that I saw um, about three years ago or so, um, a 67-year-old gentleman who presented with shortness of breath and cough for several months uh, duration. His history was significant for uh, obstructive sleep apnea, hypertension, and uh, gastroesophageal reflux disease. And um, uh, a dry cough for past four years, and then uh, no history of connective tissue disease or symptoms. Uh, he does have history of 20 years uh, uh, of cigar smoking, uh, apparently quit 25 years ago, but um, his family believes that he still uh, smokes occasionally. So that's the, um, uh, uh, the smoking history for this patient. He did work uh, building fiberglass boats uh, for the Navy as a part of his occupation, and there is no history of or family history of lung disease. Um, now, these are his PFTs here. As you see, there is a moderate restrictive ventilatory airway defect with some uh, diffusion lung capacity uh, reduction, 55% of predicted, and uh, no significant change in the post-bronchodilator setting. And the CT scan image is shown on the right side here. Uh, the basilar portions are shown. And um, um, so we'll elaborate this a little bit more in the following slide. So this is the uh, video of this gentleman's CT scan of the chest. As you see on the on the upper uh, zones, there is some ground glass opacities, and then in the in the lower zone, you see certain patterns. So as you look at uh, through this um, uh, pattern, there is an audience poll here. Uh, which pattern do you think uh, most uh, uh, fitting for this patient? So go ahead and take uh, uh, thirty seconds. Is this uh, when the timer starts, Matteo? Correct. It is 30 seconds. Okay. So go ahead and uh, take your pick. All right. So we have uh, the results. 5% uh, picked UIP, 37% picked probable UIP, 53% uh, uh, picked indeterminate for UIP, and uh, only 5% picked alternate diagnosis. So Sa Sandeep, what, what, describe what you see here in a little more detail, I guess. So um, in the upper zones, as I was uh, about to describe, is you see some ground glass opacities and um, um, in the periphery and in the basis, you see some traction bronchiectasis, some uh, reticulation. Um, and so that's the kind of, uh, you know, findings that you see here. And also some asymmetry, right? So much worse at the left base than at the right base. Um, Dr. Podolanchuk, uh, uh, what do you think of this CAT scan? Uh, keeping in mind that there can be considerable inter-observer disagreement when uh, two pulmonologists look at the same scan or when a radiologist and a pulmonologist look at the same scan. So when I first saw this, um, I, I my it, initial thought was that this is a probable UIP pattern with a superimposed acute exacerbation because of all that ground glass that we're seeing in the upper lobe. So none of the above. <laughs> Dr. Bonsall, what would you how would you characterize this CAT scan? So, you know, that's the beauty of the MDD, right? So uh, it's okay to disagree with each other. So, but I kind of agree with uh, Anna that it's uh, uh, it's probable UIP. Uh, that's what I thought. Maybe with some acute exacerbation, um, either with atypical pneumonia or or some other uh, sort. So, um, 
So that would be my pick uh, out of these four, probably UIP. And which feature is missing that uh, sort of takes a uh, definite UIP off the table here? So the honeycombing, if it's present, then um, uh, an absence of ground glass opacities, that would make it classic UIP. So uh, just to capture or recapture of what we just discussed, you saw some ground glass opacities in the upper zones and then reticulation in the periphery and uh, uh, traction bronchiectasis at the uh, uh, base of the lungs, more prominent on the left side. So our differential diagnosis when we see an ILD is uh, uh, pretty typical um, and it's listed here. Uh, the lung cancer is always there, uh, atypical pneumonia, DIP, IPF, fibrotic NSIP. Um, so after discussing with our colleagues, we decided that this patient um, would be uh, most appropriate based on his uh, uh, personal preference and the clinical factors for a transbronchial biopsy with NBZIA genomic classifier along with the BAL. Um, some of the serology is mentioned here. Uh, the ANA rheumatoid factor, the serology was negative and his ESR was 22. And this was the uh, genomic classifier result. Um, as uh, mentioned before, it's a binary result. So you'll see either positive or negative and uh, 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 with the 91% uh, specificity. So this uh, patient has a positive UIP based on the Invisia genomic classifier. So, and then we went back and uh, had another discussion uh, considering all his clinical factors, radiology, and now taking into consideration of the genomic classifier positivity, um, the diagnosis of IPF was made and the recommendation was to start him on antifibrotics. So he has been on antifibrotics tolerating well for almost you know three years now, doing really well. His uh, lung function has been relatively stable and so has his uh, HRCT findings. So this is our ex uh, experience at Penn Highlands. Um, we've done, uh, I think by now it's uh, over 140 cases, but that's the data that we uh, collected uh, uh, about a month ago or so. And out of our uh, 140, 133 samples were resulted. And out of those samples, the UIP positivity rate was 45%. And then as you break that uh, uh, category down uh, based on the probable UIP indeterminate versus or, uh, other diagnosis, so probable UIP, the NVIDIA positivity rate was 65%. In the indeterminate category, it was 40%. In the others, it was 27%. Uh, the median age was 72 uh, with uh, two thirds of males and one third females. So when you stack that data um, alongside with the validation studies and the, the national use as data provided by uh, the company, the validation studies, 39% positive uh, rate, uh, all comers, and the national use about 48%, and our uh, experience was 45%. So fairly similar uh, to the national experience uh, with some variation there. Um, so um, going back to our algorithm, um, how do you integrate NVIDIA genomic classifier into the into your work of ILD? Um, and this slide was shown before um, already. So again, you'll start with the patient suspected of having IPF and then uh, potential cause associated condition. You will go through the uh, uh, elaborate history and physical and then do a HRCT with appropriate metrics and parameters. And then um, uh, either probable UIP or UIP with appropriate MDD discussion, uh, you can potentially start them on the on the treatment. Now, if there is any uh, doubt, then that patient could uh, benefit from NVIDIA genomic classifier. Now, for the indeterminate UIP and the alternate diagnosis, uh, especially where the UIP uh, pattern could be prognostic, uh, you could consider NVIDIA genomic classifier. Uh, bronchoalveolar lavage uh, plus minus uh, transbronchial lung cryobiopsy, um, again, should be done at the centers where there is appropriate expertise and backup. Uh, uh, one thing to keep in mind regarding the cryobiopsy that as you look at the lung uh, structure in three dimension, uh, most of the uh, uh, interstitial lung disease, or at least early interstitial lung disease happens in the periphery of the lung. And as you're doing the cryobiopsy in the extreme periphery of the lung, you have to be very, very careful as the pneumothorax rate uh, goes up. So um, something to keep in mind as you're um, uh, you know, doing these biopsies or trying to launch that program in your institutions. And of course, surgical lung biopsy is always there as a, as a gold standard. But uh, in our setting, I can uh, tell you all that we have been able to diagnose uh, uh, far more um, 
uh, UIP patterns just by looking at the clinical patterns, history and physical examination, and then using uh, NVIDIA genomic classifier. So um, before I hand over uh, back to Anna, um, you know, as she mentioned earlier, uh, genomic classifier positivity is not a diagnosis by itself. It has to be taken into the right clinical context, as I you know, kept saying again and again, that alone, that positive test alone does not confer the diagnosis of uh, UIP. Thank you. Back to you, Anna. Thank you. Um, so now I'm going to go over some, some new data um, on the impact of Invisia classifier on the progression and treatment uh, of, um, in patients with various types of interstitial lung diseases. And so why are we going through all this workup and, um, and, and testing to begin with? Well, we're trying to make a diagnosis of a specific type of interstitial lung disease in order to determine, to, to determine what is the uh, most appropriate treatment for patients um, and how to counsel them on what their prognosis is. Um, and so we know that a UIP pattern is uh, present in many uh, in, in many different types of interstitial uh, sub disease uh, types, um, and it is um, and having that pattern is um, usually associated with a poor prognosis. And so to dig a little bit little bit deeper into this, um, for example, in patients with chronic patient chronic hypersensitivity pneumonitis, they can have various patterns. Um, of fibrosis and inflammation on biopsy and on CT, um, and including a UIP pattern. You can see here that um, patients with chronic HP and a UIP pattern had um, the lowest uh, cumulative survival as compared to uh, to patients with bronchiolar centric fibrosis or fibrotic NSIP pattern or a um, cellular NSAP, NSAP pattern. So as the degree of fibrosis increases, the prognosis worsens and uh, survival decreases. Um, and this is also um, seen in patients with connective tissue diseases. So I've so shown you this, but to look at it again, um, in patients with um, RAILD, um, that UIP pattern um, is associated with worse survival compared to an NSIP pattern. And so again, it's so important to try to identify those patients with that UIP pattern. And uh, to... Um, we use it to determine which patients can benefit or receive harm from immunosuppressive therapy. Um, so again, this is um, this, the same graph I showed you er, er, uh, earlier, um, showing that patients with um, uh, non-UIP patterns um, can um, stabilize their lung function when they are treated with immunosuppression therapy. This is in contrast to patients with IPF. This is data from the PANTHER trial, which was our landmark trial. Um, prior to the publication of this study, patients with IPF were routinely treated with a combination of prednisone, azathioprine, and acetylcysteine. Um, and the PANTHER study showed that treatment with this combination therapy was associated with uh, worse outcomes and increased risk of death or hospitalization. Um, and so from, we currently don't, that, that treatment is contraindicated in patients with IPF. And so I'm going to talk about some data um, that looks at the use of an Invisia classifier as a potential biomarker that can be useful to predict uh, FEC change and treatment response. And so this is um, a retrospective analysis of the BRAVE study that looked at the Invisia result um, as well as change in FVC that was closest to one year and treatment for interstitial lung disease um, in patient in in patients enrolled in the BRAVE study who underwent pathological evaluation for an undiagnosed interstitial lung disease. The thing to remember is that the patients um, in the BRAVE study had a diverse uh, set of interstitial lung disease subtypes um, that, that were represented um, and, and determined at the end of the study. And doctors in the BRAVE study were blinded to the Invisia test results. And so in this study, um, the hypothesis was that patients with an Invisia positive result would show a greater decline in force vital capacity over time 
compared to Invisia negative patients. And also patients with an Invisia positive result treated with combination therapy. So um, either steroids combined and or non-steroidal immunosuppressive therapy would show a greater decline in phosphoidal capacity compared to Invisia positive patients not treated with combination therapy. So kind of mimicking what we saw in the Panther study. Can we, can we replicate that? So these are the demographics of this cohort, uh, and it's broken down by patients who are positive for the Invisia UIP pattern and patients who are negative for the Invisia UIP pattern. Um, and it was a pretty even breakdown in this study. Patients who were um, positive for the UIP pattern were older, um, and the breakdown um, of gender and uh, sex and race was similar. Um, the study was largely um, initiated prior to antifibrotic therapy, and so um, a large proportion of patients in this studies were not on antifibrotic therapy, 89% in the non-UIP arm and 63% in the Invisia UIP arm. Um, and there was a, a range of immunosuppressive therapy that was used uh, in the BRAVE study. And this shows you um, the uh, outcome in terms of change in FVC broken down by Invisia positive versus Invisia negative. Patients who are negative for the Invisia genomic classifier on average had a 1%, uh, 1 percentage point increase in FVC uh, compared to patients who were um, patients who were negative for the Invisia classifier had a 1% uh, improvement in FVC uh, over the, the course of the study compared to patients who were positive for an Invisia classifier who had a three percentage point uh, decrease in their FVC over one year. Um, and so this shows you that the Invisia genomic classifier may have utility in identifying patients with IPF as well as non-IPF progressive pulmonary fibrosis with an underlying UIP pattern Earlier in, their earlier in their disease course, allowing for more appropriate treatment um, to potentially impact um, FVC loss and slow disease progression. And um, in another analysis um, here, looking at treatment response um, in patients broken down by Invisia negative versus Invisia positive result, patients who were uh, positive for the Invisia genomic classifier um, and they were treated with immunosuppressive therapy shown in that long green bar, um, whether it was steroid or other immunosteroids steroids or other immunosuppressive therapy, had a drop uh, in FVC um, of uh, nine, nine percentage points over one year compared to uh, patients who were positive for Invisia but not treated with immunosuppressive therapy who only had a drop in FVC of um, near uh, two percentage points. That was um, in comparison patients who were negative uh, for the Invisia genomic classifier who really there wasn't that much of a difference um, in terms of uh, treatment in response to immunosuppressive therapy. So again, kind of similar to that Panther study result showing that patients who have that UIP pattern really Really don't do well on immunosuppressive therapy. So in summary, uh, I hope I've convinced you that making an accurate a diagnosis of interstitial lung disease is, an, is important to inform the initial treatment, um, and yet making this diagnosis can be challenging using the existing tools, especially as we are moving further away from using surgical lung biopsy due to the concern for risk from surgical lung biopsy in these patients. Um, and so making a distinction of a UIP pattern is important when we try to determine the underlying type of interstitial lung disease um, and counsel patients on the likelihood of progression. Uh, and the Invisia classifier can be used um, to accurately detect a genomic pattern of usual, usual interstitial pneumonia or UIP. And it is designed as a complement to high, high resolution chest CT, as well as clinical factors for a more confident diagnosis of idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis, as well as to help guide IOD prognosis in patients with interstitial lung disease. Um, and I will end with that. And we have some time for questions, I think. Well, thank you very much to both of you. That was a, a great uh, webinar.
There are some questions in the chat and what I'll do is read them out and you guys can uh, decide amongst yourselves who's the best person to answer it. Or maybe I'll direct it to one individual or another. Um, first, uh, oh, this is a very good question for Dr. Bonsell. Is there any difference in the invisible yield results between cryobiopsy and just plain traditional transbronchial biopsy? So, you know, cryobiopsy is not really recommended uh, because those validation studies were actually performed using transbronchial uh, forceps biopsies. And to the best of my knowledge, there is no uh, data that compares cryobiopsy yield versus traditional transbronchial biopsy yield. And uh, they are occasionally done together as independent procedures, correct? Cryobiopsy yeah. for pathology and, and transbronchial biopsy for, um, for invisible? Correct. And some literature to su suggest that they're, they can be complementary those two things. Good. Um, so how often, uh, this is a question for either of you, how often will one get a positive invisia with any fibrosing interstitial process? I can start on that one and then um, maybe um, Dr. Bansell can, uh, can add in. The genomic classifier is um, designed to really specifically detect a UIP pattern based on that gene expression profile of 190 different genes that we think are associated specifically with UIP. We know that in patients with interstitial lung disease, there's sometimes two different patterns that can be found on histopathology. For example, they can have some features of NSIP and in some other areas of their lungs, they can have a UIP pattern. There's pretty long-standing data now that shows that, that UIP, P pattern drives the prognosis, even if there's other features, and that those patients really um, do progress and have the the worst outcomes. Um, and so, you know, kind of we think that having UIP trumps everything. I don't know. If we truly know that um, it's it's not picking up, you know, some other forms of fibrosis. But regardless, I think it's it's pretty useful as a marker of progressive of a progressive fibrosing process that we see in, in UIP. I don't know if um, the two of you have anything to add to that. So um, I guess it depends on how you define fibrosing interstitial process. Um, you know, if we're talking about probable UIP pattern and indeterminate UIP pattern, then we have data that the positivity rate is in the range of about 40 to 45 percent depending on which data you look at. So I presented our data that was 45% all, comer, uh, all comers. And if, if I exclude the alternate diagnosis, then that, that number is slightly higher. And if you look at the national, uh, the validation study and the national data, so the numbers are in the range of about 40, 40 to 45%. So if you're talking about that. Now, if you're talking about a progressive pulmonary fibrosis uh, patient, um, that's, that's hard to say, um, you know, whether that's, Truly, we can put a percentage to that. Uh, what do you think, Bill? No, I think that's uh, very accurate. There's also some uh, data from some single center uh, studies that show that patients with an uh, alternate diagnosis pattern occasionally have uh, a UIP, an underlying UIP genomic signature that, as Anna pointed out, is is, is likely to drive the, the course of their disease. Uh, and and then there can be these uh, a number of patients with a mixture of patterns. Um, but you find uh, a mixture of CT patterns, but you find a genomic signature of UIP underlying. So some great questions. So <clears throat> here's a question uh, uh, for you, Anna. If a patient is on immunosuppressive therapy for other pre-existing conditions, how do we take that into account with regards to Invisia and the radiographic diagnosis uh, of uh, radio diagnosing UIP, I guess? Um, how, how would you take out, I'll, I'll turn that into an Invisia question, and, how would you, uh, what would you do with their positive Invisia result if they had to be on immunosuppressive therapy for other reasons? Yeah, no, that, that's a great question. And that's what makes taking care of these patients really challenging. I mean, we often represent them in MDD and discuss what everybody would do. Um, that's certainly a patient that I would watch very closely and consider adding antifibrotic therapy up front or early on in their disease course if they have a UIP pattern. Um, you know, whether to stop their immunosuppressive therapy, I think that has to be individualized to the to each patient um, if they need it for, for a systemic condition for a connective tissue disease or something, then we continue it and we just watch them very closely. But I think, you know, certainly antifibrotic therapy would be um, 
appropriate in most of those situations. And in your experience, do patients tolerate that that combination of therapy, immunosuppressive therapy with antifibrotic therapy reasonably well? I mean, if yeah, you... usually they do pretty well. Um, you know, we have lots of patients um, with non-IPF interstitial lung disease that ha- that that the combination of mycophenolate and antifibrotic therapy. We saw, you know, for example, in um, in the scleroderma study with nintedinib that that you know there were side effects, but patients did do okay and were able. Most patients were able to continue therapy. Okay, again, some very excellent questions. So we have a, uh, uh, a participant asking, suppose you have a patient with chronic cough, uh, restrictive pattern on PFTs and imaging that is indeterminate for UIP, and they have a result of Invisia positive. What is your next step? Do you go? Do you start antifibrotic therapy on these patients sooner um, than you would if the Invisia was negative? Uh, and then a sub-question, does the Invisia, Invisia have the capability of predicting UIP specific to IPF? versus other ILDs uh, that also present with UIP? Uh, yeah, so if a patient has um, an indeterminate uh, UIP, pa- uh, in, a CAT scan that's indeterminate for UIP, and I think there was cough and a restrictive pattern, I would offer treatment with antifibrotic therapy. Um, if that, you know, coming, you know, trying to still bringing that um, constellation of data to an MDD, trying to still make a diagnosis of a specific interstitial lung disease. Um, but generally, to me, that is a, a pretty good um, indication that uh, antifibrotic therapy is, is, you know, should be considered at least and discussed with the patient. Um, and the second half of the question was, uh, they've had several cases of Invisia positive, but were found to have autoimmune ILD. Um, you're, you're comfortable with that clinical uh, framework, correct? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think we see that yeah, UIPB fat pattern can be found in different types of interstitial lung diseases. Um, you know, th- there's, that's why we try to take everything together and make that clinical diagnosis. Um, but, you know, again, if there's a UIP pattern, I still treat for the under, underlying interstitial lung disease, and then I, I think about adding antifibrotics sooner. And I, I agree with Anna. So uh, of all the UIP positive patients that we have uh, diagnosed over the past several years, um, or we keep a very low threshold of starting the antifibrotics for these patients. And and of course, taking into patients, uh, consideration the patient's uh, preference and the clinical picture. Um, but, um, you know, the question is, once you have that actionable data, um, why would you not consider antifibrotic? So uh, a third part of that question, uh, it's another interesting uh, element. Um, what do you do when you get a patient with an Invisia negative result? What's your approach to those patients? So Invisia negative patient uh, does not mean that they don't have UIP. So uh, that's a very important uh, point to remember, you continue the workup and um, and maybe consider doing another follow-up imaging study um, three months or in, of course, the PFDs and see if they are progressing um, and, and discuss those in a prop- appropriate MDD format. Um, and then maybe consider surgical lung biopsy for those patients. So uh, again, a negative result does not mean that patient does not have UIP. Yeah. Anna, would you agree? Absolutely. I think you know, at that point, we have to continue our workup for the ILD and whether that's looking at longitudinal progression or um, going if the patient's appropriate for a more invasive testing with a surgical lung biopsy. That, that's exactly what I would do. Yeah, the test was very specifically developed to be a rule in test with high specificity. And that does come then with a, a lower sensitivity. The goal was to uh, minimize the likelihood that a patient would have with a positive ro- result would be a false positive given the implications for, for labeling somebody in genomic UIP. So uh, I think we have time for um, uh, one or two more questions. And uh, this is, uh, I think, the very first question um, that was uh, entered into the chat. So I apologize for getting to it last. Um, uh, this uh, participant says, I had a COVID patient and months later presents with pers- persistent reticular opacities. The genetic test, Invisia, came back positive. How would you treat this patient? Should I go ahead and treat as if I would IPF? I think all of us, um, probably most of us in this call have spent uh, quite a bit of time looking at uh, fibrotic uh, sequelae of, of COVID. Um, how would you handle that patient? Sandeep? So I have had my fair share of patients 
with that picture. Uh, the first and foremost question is, uh, did this patient actually have ILD before he had COVID? And a lot of these patients, a lot of my patients at least, had no imaging before COVID. And, and after COVID, we were f- finding out, okay, now patient has interstitial lung disease. Understood that COVID can cause fibrotic interstitial lung disease. Um, but again, we don't know if that was present before COVID or not. So irrespective of that fact, um, uh, I would look at the patient and if they're symptomatic and they have the indeterminate UIP pattern and the genomic classifier came back positive, I would treat that patient as uh, ILD with you know UIP pattern with antifibrotics. Um, the answer to that question is yes in my mind. Anna? I completely agree. Um, we, my, my bias, and I think we're going to see some more data coming out in the next couple of years, but my bias is that most of the patients with a more of a progressive or IPF-like pictures that are um, that is coming to light after COVID had either pre-existing IOD or perhaps IOLAs, interstitial lung abnormalities, or a predisposition to IOD that um, was just unmasked and accelerated by their COVID. And so, um, I, you know, I would look at the individual patient at the extent of their disease and, like Sandeep said, um, their symptoms, but, you know, have a low threshold to treat them with antifibrotic therapy in the presence of a genomic UIP pattern. I know uh, COVID has not been with us uh, for long enough to have a lot of longitudinal data, but have you had good clinical experiences with patients uh, with fibrotic disease as a consequence of COVID and, and uh, being treated? you see seen disease stability in that setting? Yeah, I think so. Um, we do, Again, most of the patients with just some residual post-COVID fibrosis do not have a progressive fibrotic picture. So um, I think the patients that do have a concern for progressive interstitial lung disease because of a UIP pattern or because their symptoms are progressing or their lung function is declining, um, they they should be treated as they have you know as as they as if they have an ILD and they you know they do well and they tolerate antifibrotic therapy generally pretty well in those situations. But not most of them don't need treatment. I don't I don't mean to imply that they do. It's really to select you. I think uh, we have time for one last question uh, that's in the chat. Is there any data comparing clinical outcomes of positive versus negative in Vizia with respect to mortality or time to lung transplantation, for example? I do understand that this is a very new test. Thank you. So I'll actually field that question and then uh, either of you can contribute. Um, the answer is uh, most of the clinical validation data um, uh, looked at the um, the uh, specificity of the diagnosis, uh, sensitivity and specificity of the test. Uh, Verisite is sponsoring right now an ongoing uh, clinical utility study to look at uh, a variety of, of metrics in interstitial lung disease, but including uh, how uh, those patients fare over time after their identification of being genomic UIP and, and the consequences of that being uh, being started on antifibrotics. So the answer is that that data is coming. Um, if anyone uh, has a patient that they'd like to enroll in that trial, or if you're uh, at a place, uh, a site that would like to participate in the trial, please um, reach out to me at billbullman at verisite.com. Um, with that, I'm going to conclude our webinar. Uh, again, Dr. Podolanchuk, Dr. Bonsal, very, very uh, grateful to both of you for joining us today. And um, I uh, hope you all have a very nice afternoon. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Bye.